Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rackin' Auditorium is made possible by Lord Bloodraw's Patreon supporters. Lord Bloodraw keeps the love of vintage horror and science fiction alive with three weekly shows. The Nerve Rackin' Auditorium, Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rackin' Theater, the long-running syndicated TV series presenting horror and science fiction feature films, and the Patreon-exclusive series Lord Bloodraw's Cathode Zone, presenting episodes of classic genre TV shows. For more info, and to see the premiere episode of Lord Bloodraw's Cathode Zone, go to patreon.com slash lordbloodraw. Ah, I'm so glad you're here. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Lord Bloodraw. I host horror and science fiction films on my TV series, Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rack and Theater, but here, in this cool, intimate darkness, I'll be presenting tales of horror and the uncanny solely for you, alone. In this auditorium within your mind, you will coalesce the settings and the players from the ether of your imagination. Your terror will be your own creation. This is the sorcery of sound, the subtle magic of old time radio. Horror. Horror. Please leave your eyes at the door. You will not need them. This is Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rackin' Auditorium. Home is where one feels safe, secure, at ease. In one's home, the outside world with all its concerns and dangers are locked out, left behind. And one can relax in complete peace of mind. One trusts their home. It may be an odd thing to say, but one must trust their home. Because a home, a house, can have its own motives, its own needs, which may not be in your best interests. Here's a tale of one such house. From the clock comes the tale, Dream House. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. The human mind reacts in two separate ways. While we're awake, our conscious mind is more or less in command. While we sleep, the subconscious takes over. And time also undergoes a change between the waking and slumbering mentality. While we sleep, we seem to be able to cover a lot more ground in a lot less time. There's a theory, for instance, that a whole sequence of events which flash before us in a dream may pass in a matter of seconds, even though it might seem to us in our slumber that these events are taking hours to transpire. For our subconscious is energetic and knows no restraints, and the power of suggestion can have a profound effect upon it. In fact, the power of suggestion can have a profound and agonizing effect upon our lives. There it is, Cora. That must be the house. That one? Oh, the tin is beautiful. I, I can't believe it. Do you think they made a mistake in the ad? Oh, they must have a house like this completely furnished for only three pounds a week in this day and age. Well, maybe they've never heard of the housing shortage. Oh, darling, we're only 30 miles from the city, not 30,000. <laughs> Even the dead must have heard of the shortage by now. Cora. Oh, 
I'm sorry, dear. I've got how superstitious you are. Oh, it's not that I'm superstitious. It's it's just that I, I don't like morbid jokes. Oh, don't mind me, Ted. I'm so sick and tired of looking for a place to live. I've lost my sense of humor. It does get aggravating after a while, you know, to run from one hotel to another. And at those prices. Yeah. Oh, well, anyway, let's go and have a look. Oh, you, you know, I won't believe it's true until I need to leave. Just look at the way the place has been kept. It's, it's perfect. Well, the people that moved out of here must have been crazy. Uh, if we get in there crazy, they think we'll ever move out. <laughs> Times and everything. Oh, there's a catch in it somewhere. Yes. Uh, there was an advertisement in the papers uh, about renting this house. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Come oh, Thank you. Um, has anyone got here before us? Just two couples. Oh, no. oh but neither of them wanted to rent. No. What? The rent is uh, three pounds, isn't it? Three pounds a week, young man. Are you the owner? Oh, no, no. I'm the caretaker. Mrs. Chelsea's my name. Oh, let me show you around. Now, uh, this is the living room. What? Oh, it's charming. Well, look, there's a piano in here and everything. Ted, the furniture's brand new. Oh, yes. The house itself is less than a year old. Uh, just come this way, please. Uh, this is, is the dining room. Oh, oh, brother, look at that setup. Uh, does the crockery come with the house? Everything you see in here is included in the rent. Oh. <laughs> well, everything's been left exactly the way the uh, former tenants left it. Uh, there are two bedrooms upstairs. Now, would you like to see them? Um, wait a minute, Mrs. Chelsea. What's the catch? Cora. Well, we may as well face it, Ted. The place is too much of a bargain. <laughs> is it haunted, Mrs. Chelsea? Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> Not that we'd mind a few ghosts. <laughs> Heaven knows we have to share with everything else. Well, the house isn't haunted, and there are no ghosts. Well, then what's the trouble? Why did the last two couples turn it down? I don't know. Uh, do you want the house? Uh, Cora, please, let me handle this. Uh, look, Mrs. Chelsea, we're we're anxious to take this place. Now, if there actually are no hitches to the lease, we'll sign it right now. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> I'm getting a little tired of all those silly people running in and out that way. It's easy to see that the place is worth three times the money, and simply because it... Never mind. Uh, I'll get the lease ready. Ted, wait a minute. Well? Ted, why on earth do you think this place is so easy for us to get? Maybe it's Dan. No, no, I, I was thinking about those other people that Mrs. Chelsea mentioned. Are you coming in to sign? I have the lease ready. Well, Cora, what do you say? Mm, all right, Ted. There's no point in being silly about it. I only hope we don't regret it. Look on this table, Ted. Oh, wonderful. Where did you get those zinnias? From my garden. Aren't they lovely? I'll say. Oh, you know, whoever was here before us had very good taste. <laughs> you mean the, uh, the ghosts? Ted, get a new joke. <laughs> you were the one who brought it up. I know, but you were just as suspicious as I was. Only a little more sensible. All right, darling, you can preen yourself. Well, we've been here a week. No ghosts, no visions. <laughs> Not even a measly chain rattling. I know. Very disappointing. I was really hoping to meet a ghost or two. Oh, you were? Yes, I was. A nice ghost, like my great-grandfather, maybe. He was a lovely ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Your great-grandfather, maybe. <laughs> I wonder he wouldn't use the chime. Old-fashioned, that's all. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Am I disturbing you? Well, why, no. I need Lola, your neighbor. Oh, please come in. Thank you. I should say I'm your nearest neighbor. We're actually a quarter of a mile apart. Uh, you're Mrs. Bellows? Yes, yes. And this is my husband, Ted. How do you do? Glad to know you. I really came over to make your acquaintance. And, uh, well, just to ask if there was anything I could do to make you more comfortable. Oh, thank you very much, Mrs. Lawler. But Mrs. Chelsea did an excellent job before she left. Oh, yes, Mrs. Chelsea... I met her once or twice. She must have been rather relieved when you signed your lease. I know she's been trying to get someone in here for weeks so she could leave and take another job. Why is it she had so much trouble? Yes, yeah, she wouldn't tell us. <laughs> Ted and I thought there might be a couple of ghosts in the closet at first, but <laughs> yes. we were disappointed. There are no ghosts as such, as far as I know. Well, what do you mean, uh, as such? Well, I... 
perhaps I shouldn't tell you what I mean. It would be so much more pleasant for oh, you. Oh, no, please, we insist. Really, this is getting to be the mystery of the year as far as we're concerned. There's no mystery to it. A couple named Hawthorne built this house and furnished it. Mm -hmm. A bank, your present landlord, bought it from them just before the end. What, what, what do you mean, just before the end? One night, Elsie Hawthorne was found sitting at that desk chair with a bullet through her head. Oh. And her husband, Bob, was found on the floor beside her, poisoned to death. Oh, that's oh. horrible. But, but, but what happened? Why did they do it? Did they kill e each other? So the coroner surmised. Elsie poisoned Bob's drink, but he killed her before the poison took effect. Huh? So, so that's why people avoided the place. Oh, it's pretty bad. Oh, well, things like that will happen. They must have both gone out of their minds. No. There's no indication that either of them was insane. I saw them both only the day before the murder. If they were crazy, they didn't show it. But what was the motive? There was no motive. Oh, that's impossible. Well, every crime has a motive. A man or a woman may kill for money or, or out of passion. If they kill for any other reason, it's, it's plain insanity. They had a reason, but no one ever found out what it was. The reason had something to do with this house. Uh, how do you mean? I can't explain it because I don't know. But once or twice... I detected a note of fear in Elsie Hawthorne's voice when she spoke of the house. A fear she never explained. But what was there about the house that frightened her? It's a perfectly charming place. We've been all through it. I can only tell you this, Mrs. Bellows. Something about this house drove those two young people to kill each other. I hope that you never discover what that something was. <laughs> Goodness, she's gone. Did she worry you, Cora? She annoyed me. She didn't have to make such a movie mystery out of the story. Those two poor people. Now she's writing a whodunit around them just to amuse herself. I don't know. She she seemed to be so sincere. Hmm. I noticed you were impressed with her sincerity every time you looked at her leg. Oh, now, darling. Yes, I'm jealous, Ted. <laughs> I'm jealous of every woman you meet. Especially the gorgeous ones like Eve Lawler. Oh. What could it have been there? Now, what could have made those two people murder each other? Ted, I don't know, and I don't care. All I can say is that Mrs. Hawthorne had excellent taste, and I, I'm crazy about her house. Have you really been all through it, Cora? Well, almost. While you were at work, I went through most of the stuff upstairs in the rooms we don't use. Find anything? No. What would you expect me to find? I don't know. She's got some very interesting things here, and... They're anything but creepy. What about that desk? Oh, it's locked. Haven't you tried to open it? Ted, why should I want to open it? I use the desk in our bedroom. I just thought you might have been curious. Well, even if I wanted to open it, I couldn't. I don't have a key. I could force it open with a knife. You have no right to do that. It doesn't belong to us. Uh, I guess you're right. Well, let's forget about it. Ted? Yes? Uh, have you ever noticed the color of this room? Noticed it? Sure. Oh, what color are the walls? Brick red. No, they're not. You look again. It's funny. If you keep staring at them, the, the color seems to run. I mean, the shade changes. Yes. Oh, it's just the way the light comes in through those windows, that's all. The, the, the shadows it throws are deceiving. Right. I'm trying to think of what this color reminds me of. It doesn't remind me of a thing. The color just seems to run, that's all. That's it, Ted. What is it? The color running. Ted, a long time ago, I, I saw a man who was killed in an accident. He, he was just lying there in the street, Ted. These walls, they remind me of the blood that was running down his face. slowly for someone who watches the clock. And if you keep your eye on the hour hand, you'll find it moves with exasperating languor. 
And fear can enter into the mind with a sluggishness that is even less perceptive. But once there, it grows to a monstrous size with extraordinary speed. Good evening. <laughs> oh, you startled me. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you ring. I knocked. Evidently, you were so busy you didn't notice. The door was open. We have chimes, you know, and they work. I never use those chimes. Why not? Because Bob Hawthorne hated them so. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. Are I... you trying to force that desk open? Well, I, I was just wondering what was inside. I don't have a key. I don't think you'll find anything of interest. Bob didn't use it very much. You seem to know a great deal about the Hawthorns. I, I, I saw them on and off for almost a year. We often played bridge together. Elsie was a very interesting woman. Yes, I imagine she was. You probably admired her interior decorating. I think it's charming. Elsie had a reason for everything, and she picked up some interesting souvenirs. She had a preoccupation with death. Uh, how do you mean? Everything was a symbol to her. Those vases, for example, on the fireplace mantel. You know what they mean. Why, no. They're Indian, aren't they? Mayan. The figures portray a sacrificial ceremony. This figure over here is a Mayan chieftain, and this is a sacrificial victim. But what is he doing? Tearing her living heart out. That's very interesting. If just a bit barbaric. Some of us are no more civilized today. There are more ways than one to tear the heart out of a woman. Is Ted at home? Ted? I mean, your husband. No, he hasn't returned from work yet. I run into him very often in the morning. Do you? Yes, we've met on the train going into town. I see. Your husband is very handsome, Mrs. Bellows. Lots of women seem to think so. He's almost as good-looking as Bob was. You seem to have been very fond of Bob Hawthorne. He was very nice. I'm sorry you couldn't get that desk door open. I'm a little curious myself now to see if there's anything in it that may have belonged to Bob. Well, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to bother with it anymore. Well, I'll be on my way. Please do run in to see me sometime and uh, bring your husband with you. I say, what's the matter with you tonight, Cora? Oh, nothing, dear. You've been sitting in that chair for hours, staring at the walls. Why do you keep glancing at that desk all the time? Ted, let's open it. Open it? Yes, I... I tried to force it open myself this afternoon, but I couldn't. Will you try it? What for? I, I thought we gave up the idea. Ted, I've simply got to see what's inside that desk drawer. I'll get you a screwdriver and a hammer. Now, wait a minute. But, uh, right here in the kitchen. Oh, but, Cora, we can't damage someone else's property. Well, I'll have it refinished at our expense. Here, here you are, dear. I don't like this. Oh, go ahead, Ted, please. Oh, all right. Uh, 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 now look what I've done. It busted the lock completely. Ted, open it. Nothing much in here. Just a couple of bills and a fountain pen and, and this. What is it? Well, it looks like a locket. Mm. It's inscribed to Bob until death to his part. Well, his wife probably gave it to uh, him. Let's see what's inside. Can you open it? I think so. There we are. It's a lock of hair. Blonde hair. It must have been Mrs. Hawthorne. No, 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 it couldn't be. Why not? I found an autographed picture of Elsie Hawthorne in the attic. She was a brunette. She was? Eve Lawler is a blonde. Cora! Cora, honey? I'm in the living room, Ted. Oh, how's everything? About the same. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I was late tonight. I, I expected to be home at nine. Uh... It's midnight. Did I worry you? No, no. I knew you were in good company. What? You saw Eve Lawler this evening. Well, yes, Even I... walked you up the road. I saw you separate through the window. We met on the train. Oh, never mind the excuses. I know just what they are. They've been said before, as Elsie Hawthorne found out. Cora, what in the world is wrong with you? Surely you don't I think... found Elsie Hawthorne's diary, Ted. I've started to read it. Listen. In the beginning, it was innocent and unimportant. Later on, it grew. What grew? Bob's friendship for another woman. Now, listen to me, Cora. You... You've been acting pretty queerly lately. Are you sure you're all right? Why? Would you like to send me to a psychiatrist? Would you like to do what Bob Hawthorne tried to do, get his wife into a mental home? Cora! <laughs> oh, but forgive me, Ted. I... I don't know what's come over me. It must be this house. 
Oh, that diary. It's frightful. Cora, for heaven's sake. Oh, don't say any more. Just forget it and go to bed. Oh, Mrs. Fellow, you asked me to pay you a visit. So I have. May I come in? I'm... I'm rather busy right now. Oh, how are you? Couldn't we make it some other time? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, and, um, would you do me a favor? If I can. You might tell my husband that I'll be out for the evening. Your husband? Yes. You see, I happen to know that he's inside. Cora? It's after two. What about it? Oh, honey, I've been waiting up for you all night. I, I, I wanted to explain. No explanations are necessary, Ted. I guess I should have told you that I intended to see Eve about... Oh, so it's Eve now, is it? Well, it, it was all a perfectly innocent thing, Cora. I, I merely Look, dropped Ted, in. I can stand for almost everything, but there's one thing I won't tolerate. What's that? A liar. Good night. <laughs> It's time to do what Elsie did and put my thoughts down on paper. So, I'm keeping a diary. And in this diary will be found my thoughts, my hates, and my fears. Ted sees her often now. But he thinks I don't know. Heaven knows what they're plotting between them and how great her influence has become on my husband. For it was Eve Lawler who came between Elsie Hawthorne and her husband. And it was Eve who drove them both to their deaths. I'm sure now. I'm sure they mean to kill me. I have money in my own right, like Elsie had. Eve tried to sink her claws into Bob Hawthorne, but Elsie spoiled her plans. Now, Eve has made fresh plans, which include Ted and me. I've got to protect myself. But what can I do? I've got to put an end to all this now, before it's too late. Tonight. Tonight. Cora. How did you get in here? Why, I saw the light under the door. What do you want? You're ill, Cora. I'm all right. You leave me alone. I asked you to see a doctor. I don't need a doctor. I think you do. Cora, I... I want to give up this house. Why? Because it's no good for either of us. You've got another reason. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. Eve Lawler must have put you up to it. Why? Why? As a matter of fact, I... I did see Eve, and she told me... Well, let's not talk about that now. It's... It's late, and I want you to get some sleep. I can't sleep tonight. I'm going to make sure you do. I, I want you to take these pills. I knew it. Cora. I was waiting for that to happen, and now it has. You want to poison me. You want to kill me. Cora, for heaven's sake, it's, it's just a sleeping pill. You planned pill. it between you. I know you have. You planned it the way she planned it with Bob Hawthorne, the way else he suspected. It's all in her diary, and it's all in mine. Cora. Cora, put that lens out. Don't come near me. Don't come near me. Do you hear? Cora. <laughs> Let it burn. If I die, you'll die with me. Let it burn. Let it burn. Let it burn. Cora. Cora, darling, wake up. I, I had to knock you out to get you away from the house. But the house is it's on fire. You threw that lamp at me. Don't you remember? Uh, who is home, Mom? Cora, you, you don't know what I've been through since you've been acting this way. I, I tried to explain so many times that there was nothing between Eve and me. I saw her only because I wanted her to tell me the facts about the house. And then when I, I saw you were jealous, I, I I kept it from you to avoid more trouble. Ted, is that the truth? That's the truth, Eve lied when she said there was no motive to the Hawthorne murder. There was. There was another woman, a, a woman who disappeared. It was her hair you found in that locket. 
Well, why didn't Eve tell us that? Well, because the woman was, was never found, and Eve was afraid she'd be suspected. Oh. Well, it, it took me a long time to get that out of her, but she finally confessed, and now she's, she's moving away, and so are we. The house... completely in flames, huh? Yes. Somehow I... I feel as though everything I feared, everything I hated is burning too. The roof's gone, Cora. The house is practically in ashes. And so are those horrible thoughts I've had. The house gave them to me, Ted. It was like living in a crazy dream in that place. If a minute is lost, or an hour, it cannot be found again. No detective in the world is clever enough to locate lost time. But when our peace of mind is momentarily gone, it can be located and restored to its proper place once more to remain with us, perhaps forever. The clock will be heard again next week. Lawrence Clee writes it and Hart McGuire narrates it. As Ted and Cora, we heard John Bonney and Dinah Shearing. Others were Muriel Steinbeck and Neva Carr Glynn. The Clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. A mysterious murder-suicide took place in that house, and it needed the truth to be known. The young couple, quite happy to find such a bargain, were content to live there in peace. But the house needed the truth to be known. And in the end, it sacrificed itself. Or the distraught young lady burned it down accidentally. Either way, the truth is now known. And the house has found peace. Thank you for joining me in the Nerve Rackin' Auditorium. And I hope you'll come again. But now it's time for you to rejoin the, uh real world. I am Lord Bloodraw, and I'll be waiting here for you in the shadows of your mind until the next time you seek the darkness. Good night. <laughs>